good to live in Florida. I went to a board meeting. I'm on the board of Word of Life International and flew into Albany, New York at uh, 11 o'clock on Friday night and it was snowing as the plane landed. And I flew out at 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon and it was snowing and it didn't stop the whole time I was there. A lot of airports was closed, but they must have a uh, extra good uh, snow disposal outfit in Albany anyway. Uh, all the planes there were coming in and going out. Uh, some of their flights were canceled because they couldn't get into the other airports like Syracuse and Plattsburgh and some other airports, but uh, it was uh, was pretty. <laughs> it was windy and it was cold. <laughs> and as a Florida cracker, I don't even own an overcoat. So, <laughs> the uh, they, the reason the board meeting was held there is because they had the Ring the Bells concert there in Albany on Friday night, and they had an overflow crowd, and uh, many uh, people come to Christ there at the meeting in Albany. Uh, I think it was the fourth one on this particular road. Appreciate everybody praying for the young people on this trip. There's about 120 of them, and they were scheduled on Wednesday night in uh, Winston-Salem, and they were uh, scheduled in Savannah uh, on Thursday night, and then Lakeland Friday night. The, uh, the Savannah one had to be canceled out, and the only substitute place they got was Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. And I don't know if you know where that is, but that's right on the Virginia border. And and uh, they've got to uh, leave their performance on uh, Thursday night and drive all night on the bus and then uh, get here in time for the Friday night performance. And it was kind of a last-minute change, so I know uh, they'll appreciate your prayers for them. I don't know how that will affect the performance, but maybe we can uh, uh, pray enough to make up the difference, you think? Hosea chapter 3. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who, took, uh, to, who looked to other gods and love cakes of raisins or flagons of wine. So I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and an omer of uh, and a half omer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice, without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now we've already noted that uh, an allegory or analogy is being made uh, between the marriage of the prophet Hosea and the uh, situation between God and the nation of Israel. We've already found out that in several places in the Old Testament, God is referred to, Jehovah is referred to, as the husband of the nation of Israel, and we've pointed out why. He, he took the part of a husband, which was to provide and protect. And uh, the uh, job of this prophet is to show that Israel as a nation uh, did not uh, respond like a good wife, but went and worshipped the uh, false gods of the nations around and uh, gave them credit for the goodness. You'll remember when Israel came into the Promised Land, God said that it wouldn't be uh, a land like the land of Egypt where they were in slavery and where you had to pump the water up from the ground out of the dirty river Nile, but it would be a land where, uh, which was watered from heavens. Uh, by God himself, and it would be a land uh, of milk and honey, a land where they would uh, uh, pick fruit from trees that they didn't plant, they draw water from wells that they didn't dig, they'd live in walled cities that they didn't build, 
and they would uh, have a, a pleasant uh, place. And so when their kings went off and married uh, into idolatrous uh, royal families surrounding them, as did Ahab, who took unto himself for a queen the evil person Jezebel, who had all of God's prophets slain and set up prophets of Baal in their stead, uh, Israel had uh, given those false gods credit for their abundance, although it was God who had provided. And uh, God ha is telling Hosea to make, make analogy between Israel and his own wife. His wife Gomer, uh, you'll uh, recall, uh, bore a son by him, and then she went into harlotry, and she uh, bore two more children, which were disclaimed by him. Uh, they, he was not the father of them. And then, uh, because she would not repent, although he loved her, uh, he uh, dispossessed her from the home. And uh, God is using that to explain why Israel is going to be invaded by the country of Assyria and taken captive. And you remember, we had the analogy back in the uh, second verse of the first chapter, the latter part, where it says, uh, For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. And so we have that same analogy here in chapter 3. After, um, or we have a progression of that analogy. After uh, the wife of Hosea, that is Gomer, uh, was dispossessed. She uh, uh, made her income through harlotry, and it said she wasn't like other harlots. Uh, she got to the point where she would uh, pay her lovers, and uh, with the rather than have her lovers pay her, and that she used uh, wherewithal uh, that which she had received from Hosea, and this was an analogy that uh, uh, of Israel, of course giving credit to the false gods for the provision that God had given. But uh, God told uh, Hosea that uh, he should go and receive uh, Gomer back to himself. And uh, at this time, she was ready to come back because uh, she had been sold into slavery. And she said, uh, I was better off when I was with my husband than I am now. And so he went to the slave market and bought her back. But he didn't take her back immediately to be his wife. He said that she would have to remain many days without a man. Notice in verse 3, the latter part, it says, Thou shalt not be for, and then the word another is in italics, which means it was supplied by the translator, and it will read better without that, and thou shalt not be for man. That is to say, that uh, uh, she would not uh, have any type of intercourse with, a, with any man, including Hosea. She, in a, she had to be set aside, to be purified for a period of time. And the analogy is made with Israel in verse 4, where it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days. God said he's going to pay a price for Israel. And we're told in Isaiah, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, chapter 49 and in other places that uh, uh, God paid with the blood of Christ to purchase Israel back to himself. Not only Israel, but uh, all the nations of the world. So uh, this is, this, the analogy is this. God took Israel to himself as a wife and uh, provided for her as a husband would that is, and protected her. She gave her love to others and, you might say, bore fruit unto others. That is, her children became uh, idolaters and heathen. And then, uh, while she is in captivity, so to speak, in slavery, uh, God paid a price. But after he paid the price, he didn't bring Israel directly to himself. And Israel is still uh, uh, abiding, as is pointed out here. So what we have in this uh, very short third chapter is this. We, we have uh, Israel's past, 
and that is in verses 1 and 2. We have uh, her present, and that's in verses 3 and 4. And we have her future, and that's in verses 5. This one chapter tells the whole history of the uh, nation of Israel. Uh, God uh, uh, purchased her out of slavery, and uh, now she is abiding many days. See, if we apply, apply this to Israel in uh, verse 3, Thou shalt abide many days, thou shalt not play the harlot. It's interesting to know that Israel has never had anything to do with idolatry since their captivity, since they went into captivity. The last thing an Israelite would do would be to worship a heathen god and uh, or an image or a graven image or anything like that. Uh, they are abiding. They're uh, purifying themselves, awaiting the time when uh, Israel can again be the wife of Jehovah. So that's what ha is happening now. She's abiding many days. She's not playing the harlot. That is, although Israel does not accept Christ, uh, the uh, leaders of Israel give credibility to the one true God. And, and thou shalt not be uh, for man, uh, which is the analogy with Gomer, and the reason that this was to happen to Gomer is because, verse 4, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king. Israel has not had a king since, since they went into captivity. That was uh, uh, 600 years before Christ. They've been without a king for 2,600 years. And uh, they've been without a prince. Now the word prince... Uh, in the Old Testament is used for any number of principal persons. It, it doesn't mean uh, like uh, the Prince of Wales or that is the heir to the throne necessarily. In the Old Testament, a prince can mean any person of renown. For instance, uh, in some places, the chief priest is called a prince. You'll find this, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 43. It'll be in several places in Ezekiel, but I think in this Isaiah 43, 28, it's quite clear where he says, Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary. Uh, this would mean the priests that minister in the, uh, in the sanctuary. So here it probably means that, that for many years they wouldn't have a king, neither would they have a priest, uh, uh, which here is called a prince. And they would be without a sacrifice. Well, Israel has not had any type of a priestly sacrifice since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And uh, they've also been without an image. They haven't worshipped any false image since that time as they were doing before the captivities. And without an ephod. Well, you'll remember the ephod was the garment uh, that was worn on the outside of the high priestly garments and uh, included the breastplate which had the 12 precious stones which were graven with the 12 tribes of Israel and had the uh, on the shoulders had the epaulets which uh, had the uh, also the onyx stones with the names of Israel graven on them and uh, the ephod was what was used by the priest to determine the will of God. Uh, you know, the Urim and the Thunim were in there, and, and that's how he determined the will of God. So what this means, without an ephod, they would not be able to uh, have an access to God and his uh, wisdom for that particular period of time. And without a teraphim, well, teraphim is a little household god made of wood, usually, that they uh, used... Uh, uh, to worship with. So they wouldn't have any true worship, neither would they have any idolatrous worship for this period of time. But notice, afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now how long is it going to be since uh, this started? Well, we're going to find that out again when we get to the sixth chapter. Look at the last verse in the 15th chapter, uh, 5.15. And I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge the offense and seek my face 
in their affliction, they will seek me early. This is talking about the same time in the latter days. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So, uh, when will it be? It will be in the third day. Now, we know that that term is used both figuratively and literally. And it uh, stands for the... Uh, and when we see the term the third day, it stands for the resurrection. But here it's particularly interesting that um, we're told in the third day that Israel shall be raised up. In the third day of their abiding, the third day from when uh, these things are taken away, a king and so forth. And as the apostle Peter tells us, uh, prophetically, with God, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And we know that the day, that, e that day of the king's reign is a thousand year period. We're told this six times in the book of Revelation, that it'll be for one thousand years. That's the day that Christ shall reign on earth. That's the seventh day of time. And uh, so two and a half days would be somewhere, I mean, if it were... Uh, if it were after two days and in the third day it would be sometime between 2,000 and 3,000 years so sometime between 2,000 and 3,000 years from the time that their king was taken away and all these things were taken away then uh, their Messiah is to return well that happened 2,600 years ago so uh, uh, if we're correct in uh, the uh, figurative meaning of these times, then it means that this will have to happen sometime uh, within the next 400 years. And it could happen any moment, and could have happened any moment, as far as this scripture is concerned, any moment from uh, uh, 600 years ago, because that would be the third day. Uh, very... Uh, very interesting portion of scriptures. I realize there would be some difference of opinion as to whether or not that's what it means, but it's certainly what it means to me. Make no, I don't have any doubts about it. Now, somebody else might have, and I wouldn't uh, try to, uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, call them bad names, or I wouldn't uh, try to even convince them. But to me, it's very, very clear. And uh, I like it that way, and so don't try to convince me otherwise. I like it like this. Uh, so in verse 5, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. You know, there's several scriptures in the, in the Old Testament that say that, that, that David is literally going to come back and reign, the resurrected David. And yet other places says the king shall be the son of David, the Messiah. And... Uh, I know a, a rather large segment of fundamental Christianity, uh, Christianity look upon Christ as David in one sense. But I believe both of those things will be literally true. I believe David is the prince spoken of in the latter chapters of uh, Ezekiel uh, where the uh, millennial temple is described. And I believe the resurrected David will reign on the throne under the Messiah. Uh, Messiah will have more responsibilities than just an earthly reign. Uh, I'll give you some of the scriptures that, uh, uh, that bear on the subject, and you might want to come to uh, some conclusions along those lines. For instance, um, look back in Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34 verse 23 and I will set up one shepherd over them and he shall feed them even my servant David he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd and I the Lord shall be their God and my servant David a prince among them I the Lord have spoken it now 
when this Ezekiel was written, David had been dead between three and four hundred years. And uh, so, uh, and it was speaking of a time future. Now, as I say, some interpret this as the Messiah, the son of David. I interpret it literally. I, I believe that David shall be the one that shall be the uh, prince among them and shall rule over them in that day. There's another uh, a scripture in Ezekiel 37, verse 24. See, this is speaking about, well, let's start reading verse 22. This has to be thinking about a future time. Uh, you see, it's after this story of the Valley of the Dry Bones in, in chapter 36 of Ezekiel have the restoration of the land in, va in uh, uh, chapter 37 you have the restoration when, of Israel when the uh, life comes back into the bones and we shouldn't wonder uh, who this means because look in Ezekiel 37 11, and then he said unto me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel Behold, they say our bones are dry and our hope is lost uh, and we are uh, cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And then all of this is about the time when Israel, uh, the nation, will be resurrected. In uh, verse 21, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen or the nations, uh, whither they are gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more be two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more, neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols nor with their detestable things or with any transgression but I will save them out of their dwelling places and in which they have sinned and will cleanse them and shall and they shall be my people and I will be their God and David my servant shall be king over them see this is all talking about future and they shall all have one shepherd and shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant in which my fathers have dwelt and they shall dwell in it and they and their children and their children's children forever and my servant David shall be their prince forever you see it's it's just too many emphatic statements of such moreover i make them a covenant i make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them and i will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever my tabernacle shall be with them yea I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the Gentiles shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, and my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Um, now, those are not the only scriptures. We'll take one more in Jeremiah chapter 30. In many of the Psalms, would uh, would lead me to this same conclusion. <laughs> no, I'm in the wrong. It's in Jeremiah, but I was... Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up unto them. Uh, see that to me uh, I just take that literally. And uh, in uh, 33:15 Jeremiah In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely and this is the name which the Lord our God called the Lord our righteousness for thus saith the Lord David shall never lack a man you see now this is the other side of it where 
it's pointed out that it's speaking of a branch that shall grow up out of David. And then you put this with Luke chapter 1. And this is speaking of Christ in Luke chapter 1. Verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. See, the other side of this is that the New Testament refers to uh, the Jeremiah Scripture which says it's an offspring of David rather than David. But the two truths are so plain that I think they're both true. I think the, the ruler is actually on the throne in Jerusalem at all times will be David. And uh, he will rule under the Messiah. And... Uh, I believe that uh, this should come quite clear that there are two personages involved if we read uh, in uh, Ezekiel that section that begins with about chapter 40 and extends on through about 44 or 45. You'll see when the prince is spoken of, sometimes he has activities uh, which are human activities and wouldn't be attributed to deity. In other times, he has activities which would be attributed to deity. And so I believe both individuals are in view. Both David and the Messiah, the son of David. Okay, back to Hosea. At the end of the third chapter, the analogy is complete. And Gomer passes out of the picture. And God uh, goes on with his indictment of Israel particularly in chapters 4 or 5. In other words, it's the task of the prophet to make it very clear to his hearers why God is taking the action that he's doing. So in Hosea chapter 4, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Then he says, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. He's uh, showing them that they're violating the, the, the commandments uh, that he gave them. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwells in it shall languish with the beast of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fish of the sea shall also be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. What he's saying is, don't one of you point a finger at the other and say, yeah, I can see. Look what he's doing wrong. He's lying. He's stealing. He's doing this. He says, none of you uh, have any uh, room to, uh, to accuse another because you're all involved. And as one is sinful... And he says, for you to accuse somebody else would be like striving with God's priest or uh, telling the priest that uh, you don't have any sin, so you don't need to make any sacrifices. Verse 5, Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Now, the uh, mother here is the nation itself, and the children uh, of the mother are the... Uh, are the uh, that current generation. In other words, the thought is that God was the father and Israel was the mother and uh, the inhabitants of the land that are actually involved in the sin uh, that were brought into the sin by their mother's illicit relationship and uh, they are actively involved in sin. Verse 6, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of the Lord, and I also will forget thy children. It, this is an indictment against the priests who should be, uh, were the ones charged with the responsibility of, of giving out the righteous word of the Lord. Uh, you had a similar situation when Christ was on earth, uh, 
uh, he said they're responsible for uh, what they do and what they hear. The Bible teaches that the responsibility is not only with the teacher, the teacher will have uh, twice the, the uh, condemnation, we're told. That God's principle is this, that one who holds himself out to teach the people, if he teaches falsely, he has double condemnation. The condemnation of a, of a teacher and the condemnation of a sinner. But he does, never excuses the hearer. He says the hearer is responsible for what he hears. Uh, he said this, for instance, in, uh, in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, verse 23, If a man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. If you have a hearing ear, God will let you understand more. But be careful what you hear. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.12, it says, Know those who labor among you. Uh, know who's speaking God's word and who's not speaking God's word. You're responsible. In one place in uh, <coughs> Ezekiel, uh, we're told that uh, the uh, judgment against the hearer will be uh, the judgment of the one to whom uh, he lends his ear. By a hearer, the inference is hearing and heeding what you hear. And to hear and heed the wrong words, the hearer is condemned. Uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, there's the indictment that they've become dull of hearing. The scripture I was speaking of in 1 Thessalonians 5.12 is, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them who labor among you and, have, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them highly for, in love for their work's sake. The uh, scripture in Ezekiel is in Ezekiel 14.10. And that says, And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even like the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. In other words, uh, the, the one that speaks is responsible and the one who hears is responsible. You say, well, how could I know whether or not I was being led astray? Well, Jesus answered that in John seven seventeen. He says, if anyone wills to do the will of the Father, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. If our heart's had attitude is, whatever else, God, I want to know your will. And if I know your will, I'll do it. And he says the first thing he will do is to let you know whether the words are God words or man words. So we're without excuse. Back to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected my knowledge. The, the priests have rejected knowledge, so the people don't have any knowledge. I will also reject thee, and thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. He says, the more descendants the children of Israel had, the more I prospered them, the more sin there was against me. So he says, it's, it's hopeless. They eat up the sin of my people and they set their heart on their iniquity. Now what uh, this verse means is the priest uh, has something to eat because the people sin. You'll remember uh, if you sin and you come to confess it to the priest that he gets the choicest portion of the sacrifice. Uh, they're his to eat. And so the attitude of the priest was, well, let them sin because the more they sin, the more I get to eat. <laughs> That's the, uh, uh, that was the uh, uh, general thought here, uh, the last phrase. Uh, Therefore will I, no, uh, last phrase of verse 8, and they set their heart on their iniquity. That is, the priest set their hearts on the iniquity of the people. 
uh, saying, well, boy, this is a good deal. <laughs> this bunch of Israelites sure are a bunch of sinners. That means I get a bunch, you know, because uh, they got to come and, and uh, offer more sacrifices uh, because they've sinned more. So the more they sin, the more sacrifices are offered, the better off I am. Uh, you know, we have some systems like that today uh, where you pay to confess your sins and uh, uh, that uh, makes... Uh, well, that's built a lot of very expensive churches in the world because the people pay for their sins and the more they sin, the more they pay, the more that the priest can exact. Verse 9. And there shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. Verse 10. They shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit a whoredoms and shall not increase because... Uh, they have left off to take heed to the Lord. In other words, they'll be involved in what necessarily would uh, redound to the growing of the population, and yet their population won't grow. That's uh, uh, we got some of that today, don't we? I read some statistics about the number of abortions and, and such as that, and so... Uh, there's more and more activity uh, that should produce children, yet less and less children. Hortum and wine and new wine take away the heart. People are always looking for a, a um, verse that will prove that they shouldn't serve you so much wine. You know, on these flights to New York now, all the airlines are trying to find out who can outdo the other one. Uh, in just flying from... Orlando to uh, from Orlando to Washington I was offered wine it used to be they call it the champagne flights and they it used to be uh, that they, they just offered you champagne champagne but now they offer you champagne or two different kinds of wine the girl comes by and she says champagne white wine or red wine and on the way up I was offered it three times and on the way back, twice. They come around first before you ever take off and take your orders for liquor, you know. And then when they get sell all that they can, then they come around and give it to you free. And uh, I don't know how there could be many sober people left on the plane, uh, but uh, just in that short flight, in fact, they served, besides serving the, the drinks they paid for, they served the the wine and the champagne twice before they served the dinner. And uh, I thought I wasn't going to get anything to eat. Uh, you see, the plane took off around 2 o'clock and, and the ticket said there was a dinner meal on it, you know, uh, or lunch, uh, you know, and so I didn't eat before I got on the plane. But uh, by the time they got to take orders for everybody's liquor, then so uh, serve champagne twice. Well, uh, uh, the plane's about in its landing pattern before they ever get around to serving dinner. But uh, this is the thing. I was coming back on a charter flight from Europe, and they had had some mechanical trouble. This was on a TWA charter flight, and they'd had some mechanical trouble. So the flight was delayed three hours, and the captain says, well, you thought it was bad, but I says... Uh, it's going to turn out for you good, says, all the booze is on us, uh, all the way home, says, the liquor, cabinets are free, all you want, you can have, free, we don't, we're not going to sell any of it, and uh, so we're going to make up, well, that's rubbing salt in the, you know, you pay for that in the long run, you, somebody's got to pay, who, who you think's going to pay for it, you, the passengers pay for it, don't they, in the long run, and whether you drink or not, I wanted to go up there and fight, and, and tell him off, but I'm afraid I might make him nervous and he wouldn't know how to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a booze-drinking world. I was, uh, in, uh, I was in Washington, D.C., and they gave away these little booklets where uh, uh, National Airlines gives them away, where you get a dollar off on this and a dollar off on that and little tickets. You know, half the tickets in the whole book are a free drink before your dinner. All these restaurants are in there, and you get the drink before dinner free. But you got to pay for the dinner, see? So that's no deal at all. 
if, uh, if a person doesn't drink. But, I mean, it's uh, the world just assumes that everybody is a drunkard. The whole, the whole economy is, is assuming that. So, uh, and it says here that that takes away the heart. Uh, what it means is that uh, uh, you don't have the, the uh, you don't have the discernment to know what you're supposed to do. And so in verse 12, my people ask counsel of their images or their uh, their idols, stocks. It says that just a, a kind of a idol that's made out of a trunk of a tree, and their staff declares unto them, and the spirit of whoredom hath called them to err, and they have uh, gone a whoring or played the harlot, departing uh, from under their god. They sacrifice upon the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms because the shadow of them is good. Therefore, your daughter shall commit harlotry and your spouses shall commit adultery. What they're saying is that uh, under the shade trees is a, is a good place to uh, uh, have a party, so to speak, and so that's where they have their idol set up. Uh, that's what it means because the shadow of them is good. And he says in verse 14, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlot harlotry, nor your spouses when they commit adultery, for they themselves are separated with the harlots, and they sacrifice with harlots. Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. You see, it was the law of God that if a man's wife should commit um, uh, unfaithfulness to him, that she'd be stoned to death but God says I'm not going to enforce that because you don't deserve it if you're going to play around like that well then I'm going to put it in the minds of your wives and your uh, innocent daughters and to do the same you're going to sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind as we'll find later verse 15 for thou Israel play the harlot and yet not and let not Judah offend and come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go up to Beth Avon, nor swear the Lord liveth. Now, Gilgal were, was a place that they worshipped. You know, Gilgal was the, the first uh, place of worship that was set up by Joshua when he came across the Jordan River. And Joshua always went back to Gilgal before he started any com campaign. You'll see that place uh, mentioned again and again in the book of Joshua. Uh, in Joshua chapter 4, Verse 19, And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of, of Jericho. Now, you'll see Gilgal mentioned a number of times in chapters 4 and 5, and here's what happened at Gilgal. First, they set up the camp at Gilgal. Then they set up the memorial stones, which shows life out of death. And then they... Uh, circumcised themselves or separated themselves unto God and then they held a Passover which celebrated uh, what God had done for them and then they ate of the corn of the land and ceased to eat manna and then they met the captain of the Lord of hosts and then they departed from Gilgal to destroy Jericho and seven things happened at Gilgal in those two chapters then every time that uh, they had a, a victory they would come back to Gilgal see in uh, in chapter 9 of Joshua in chapter 9 verse 6 and they went to Joshua under the camp at Gilgal and then 10 6 and the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp at Gilgal that's because that's where Joshua was in verse 7 of chapter 10. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal. Verse 15. And Joshua returned all Israel with him under the camp at Gilgal. In verse 43. 
And Joshua returned all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. Now you'll find that again and again all through. That every time they had a victory, Joshua always brought them back to Gilgal. And he wouldn't go forth until he went forth at Gilgal. He went to Gilgal because that was the place where uh, they had separated themselves unto God. They had received their commission from death unto life and they had met the captain, the Lord of hosts, there at Gilgal. And that's why when, Josh, when Samuel defeated or, or hewed to pieces Agag, the king of the uh, Amalekites, he did it at Gilgal. He insisted that Agag be brought to Gilgal because uh, Agag stood for the, the, the best of the flesh. And the flesh was you might say, done in at Gilgal. And of course, Gilgal was one of the places that Elijah took Elisha when he was about to leave him and commission him. So to come back to Gilgal is to get started right, to get started in the power of God, it's separation from the world, and to, and to get started right. Uh, so we want to come back to Gilgal. You hear, back to Bethel? Well, that's not the way it ought to be. It ought to be back to Gilgal. I'll show you in a minute why they call it, why they say back to Bethel. Now, so God is saying in Hosea, He's saying, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 15, Neither go ye, no, it says, and come not ye unto Gilgal. It says it won't do you any good to go to Gilgal because you've gone so far from the Lord till the Lord's not hearing you anymore. And, uh, then he says, neither go up to Beth Avon. Now, Beth Avon is a name that Hosea and Amos, you'll see it again in Amos, it's a name that those two prophets give to uh, the city of Bethel. Now, you may remember the background of Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Beth Avon means house of nothingness or house of vanities. And the reason that uh, that they call it that is because uh, the reason it was the house of God is that's where Jacob met God at Bethel, the house of God. And God and, and Jacob gave God a new name. He called it El Bethel the God of the house of God. When he first worshipped there, he worshipped at Bethel because it was the house of God, and then he worshipped the God of the house of God, El Bethel. See, uh, Amos does the same thing in, in, in the chapter 4, verse 4. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgressions. This is, this is the ultimate. It was at Bethel that God that Jacob met his God at the house of God. But, if you remember, when the kingdom was divided and Jeroboam didn't want the, the people of the northern kingdom to go to Jerusalem to worship, he put a golden calf at Bethel and told them, look, you can worship, worship here at Bethel. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Of course, that was against the command of the Lord. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 12. Only in the place that God shall choose shall you offer your sacrifices. But Jeroboam, the king of Israel, set up uh, a golden calf in Bethel and says, this is what you worship. And so Hosea calls it beth Avon. Instead of the house of God, he says it's the house of vanities. And worship there is false worship. So he's, uh, what God is saying here, it won't do you any good to go to Gilgal to start with the true God or it won't do you any good to go to Bethel and say the Lord liveth. won't do any good. It won't do any good now, he says, to go there to Bethel or beth Avon, the place where they worship idols and say, I renounce my idols and I worship God. I say the Lord liveth. Jehovah lives. He says, it's too late to do that now. And uh, he explains that in verse 16, For Israel slideth back like a backsliding heifer. 
Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. The word backslide is strictly an Old Testament word. Uh, it's used incorrectly uh, many times in, uh, in referring to, to people today that either are saved or purport to be saved. And the word, we're going to have backsliding in, the, in a later chapter of, Hi, of Hosea, I believe the 11th chapter, and it means literally to slide backwards. But this word here uh, is, is not the same word. This, this uh, word really means uh, like if you had an animal by the halter and you're trying to lead them to some food and they don't want to be led, so they back back on their haunches and won't be led and uh, you have to try to pull them along and they slide along on their on their hoofs it, it, because they won't come with you the only way have you ever seen anybody drag an animal that way you've seen a dog that doesn't want to go or a, uh, or any type of an animal that you got a rope around his neck and you're trying to pull him forward and he he's got his feet braced and and, he, and the only thing you can do is if you can out pull him and, and slide him along. Well, that's the picture that you have here. Not actually backsliding. It means to, uh, uh, to rear back on the, on the leash. So the only way you can be pulled is by sliding. And it says that's the way uh, Israel as the nation was. Just like that type of an animal. God was trying to lead them to a place that would be better for them. I mean, you know, if the owner of a cow or something like that is trying to pull the, the animal along, he wants to lead them to where some water is. It's like you can lead a horse to water. Well, if the horse won't come, you can't. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the person that's trying to pull the animal wants to, to give them something good. But if they just haunch back, you know, uh, uh, then he says that's how Israel is. They wouldn't be led by God. And what he really wanted to do was to feed them in like a lamb in a large place. He says, now, all the Lord had to do was, uh, wanted to do was to bring you into a very good place. And if you'd have been supple like a lamb, and you reared back like a backsliding heifer. And that's the analogy he's making. There's some really interesting language here. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. In other words, Ephraim here is a name for the northern ten tribes and gone too far. Uh, the Bible says if uh, one being often reproved harden his neck he is suddenly cut off and that without remedy. Anybody know where that is? Proverbs. Proverbs what? Well, this was a situation we're dealing with here. Huh? Proverbs 29.1 He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. Well, now, that's the situation that Israel was in at this point. It's the same situation where God told Jeremiah, said, don't pray for him anymore. He says their sin is written on their hearts. And it won't do any good to pray for them. Verse 18, their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Uh, her lovers with shame do love. The wind shall bow, hath bound her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. What Hosea, his, his message uh, is, well, God is telling Hosea, all the things that Israel has done. And uh, he's saying, now you're to preach to them, but you're not expect any repentance. And uh, because they've sinned so long that they can't hear anymore. They're so dull of hearing that they won't hearken. And uh, this is a truth that the Bible has, that uh, that we can so rebel against God till we have no facility for listening. It's not that God has ceased to be merciful. 
And this is going to be proved by the fact that he's going to take Israel back. It's not that God ceases to be merciful. It's this that through our willfulness, we have separated ourselves from the ability to respond to God. And so it's impossible. It's no good for him to deal with us further because we wouldn't respond. We, uh, a person can have his conscience so seared and his receptive abilities so seared that, uh, that he won't respond. I told you that I got a phone call from Joe Jordan today saying that the young man that had stolen the funds down there had confessed. Well, uh, it's possible for him to steal again. And uh, each time he does, if he does, uh, he'll be hardened more. And the time will come when he won't confess. Cause, not because God is unwilling to bring him to the point of confession, but because he has hardened himself against uh a situation where he can be responsive. And a, a Christian can do this. A Christian can so uh, inure himself against the wooing and convicting power of the Spirit and resist like a backsliding heifer uh, when God tries to lead them until uh, he won't be responsive anymore. And, and uh, nobody in this room or anywhere else has ever confessed a sin in your life except the wooing of the Holy Spirit brought you to the place of confession. This is just part of our nature. We must be brought to confession. We must respond to the wooing of the Spirit. And it's possible to resist that convicting power of the Spirit to the extent that you have no responsiveness to it. And why, uh, it, why would he be obligated anymore to deal with us when we wouldn't be responsive, responsive and he knows we wouldn't be. And therefore, the time comes when God simply, in a particular life, doesn't deal with sin anymore. Why? Because he's been often reproved and hardened his neck. And so he's cut off. And that without remedy. And that was the situation with Israel at this point. God had sent... God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet and they refused to hear the prophet until God says it's no need so he let them go into captivity may we pray that our hearts will always be receptive to the wooing of the spirit that we might not place ourselves in that type of a situation God we pray that uh, these scriptures which uh, in some ways are distressing would be used in our own hearts to accomplish that which needs to be done in Jesus name Amen